Before we get started, I just want to say if you haven't seen season one of Hannibal, I don't recommend watching this video. It's a really good show, so please watch it. It's on Netflix in the US now. Also, I wanted to give a content warning for extreme gore, violence, bloodshed, psychological abuse, basically anything you can imagine would be associated with a show about a cannibal serial killer and his buddies. So thank you, and I hope you enjoy the video. Since the release of Red Dragon in 1981, Hannibal Lecter has become a cultural icon on par with Frankenstein, Freddy Krueger, or Jason. This was only further solidified in 1991 with the release of Silence of the Lambs, where Anthony Hopkins' portrayal of Hannibal, even though it only got seven minutes of screen time, chilled audiences to the bone. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you. However, the majority of portrayals of the character up until 2013 regarded him post-incarceration, when he had already been caught, was already known to be a cannibal, and was living in the Baltimore State Hospital for the criminally insane. Brian Fuller, the showrunner of NBC Hannibal, wanted to take a different spin on the character. He wanted to analyze what might have happened before Hannibal was incarcerated, when he was, quote, a practicing psychiatrist and a practicing cannibal. Okay, hello, this is me. Um, I'm gonna start off this section by giving a spoiler alert because I'm about to synopsize the entirety of season one of Hannibal. So if you haven't seen that, first of all, why? And why did you click on this video? Second of all, it's seven years old, so go watch it. Um, and I'm not sorry that I'm spoiling it. Okay, so for context, the season opens and none of the main characters know that Hannibal is actually a cannibal, which makes for some great in-jokes with the audience because Hannibal is a comedian, aside from being a psychiatrist, a cannibal, an artist, um, and like a million other things. I don't know how he has the, even has the time to do all of that. So when we open, we follow our point of view character, Will Graham, played by Hugh Dancy. Uh, Will is a high empathy FBI instructor who is enlisted by the head of behavioral sciences at the FBI, Jack Crawford, in order to empathize with serial killers so that the FBI can catch them faster. So Will's first job is to try to catch this guy called the Minnesota Shrike, who's known for basically abducting his victims who all kind of look the same, like early 20s young women, and um, no one knows where, they're go where they've gone. Um, so Jack brings Will on, and he also brings Hannibal Lecter on to create a psychological profile of the killer, um, which makes for some interesting tension right at the start of the show. Whose profile are you working on? Will and Hannibal actually work together to find this guy, um, and by work together I mean Hannibal realizes that Will is stuck, so he kills this girl named Cassie Boyle in basically like the opposite way that the Minnesota Shrike kills his victim, so Will can like see in a better light how the Minnesota Shrike kills his victims and how to find him. This cannibal you have him getting to know, I think I can help Goodwill see his face. What didn't your copycat do to the girl in the field? What gave it away? Everything. It's like he had to show me a negative so that I could see the positive. It... That crime scene was practically gift wrapped. Very sweet of Hannibal, honestly, to do that for him. And then Will and Hannibal go to this place where they think the Shrike works and they go through some files and Will finds a lead that it might be this dude called J Garrett Jacob Hobbs. And while they're there, Hannibal takes an opportunity that he finds to give Garrett Jacob Hobbs a courtesy call and warn him that the FBI are on their way. By the time Will and Hannibal make it to the Hobbs residence, Garrett Jacob Hobbs has killed his wife and is threatening to kill his daughter Abigail. But Abigail actually survives, but she's like, she has a scar on her neck, she's really wounded, and she's in a coma for a while, and Will feels terrible because he basically feels responsible for orphaning her. Will basically leaves this whole situation incredibly traumatized, especially for how high empathy he is because he essentially experiences what each of the people he empathizes with 
experiences. So he feels it like genuinely. So it kind of fucks up his brain. And Jack, the head of behavioral sciences with his ever so keen eye for psychological damage, gets Hannibal Lecter, esteemed psychiatrist, to keep an eye on Will's mental health while he works on these cases. And this goes about as well as you would expect, which is to say, oh God, very badly. Throughout the season, um, Jack kind of repeatedly encourages Will to find this one killer called the Chesapeake Ripper, who um, has evaded the FBI for years and is known for taking organs as trophies from his victims with surgical precision um, and leaving almost no evidence. And uh, spoiler alert, it's Hannibal. Hannibal is the Ripper. and. Hannibal realizes that Will might actually be able to be the person who finally catches him when Will develops the habit of telling Hannibal everything about every case he's working on in their psychiatry appointments. So Hannibal kind of always knows where Will's at, which is an interesting little dramatic irony dynamic. So Hannibal starts to try to build this level of trust with Will because not only does he know that Will is probably capable of catching him and the whole keep your friends close and your enemies closer thing, but he also finds Will kind of fascinating, like how his brain works, what he might do. He's incredibly curious about it. So he establishes this kind of like a bond with Will over Abigail Hobbs because Will feels very paternal towards her and he feels responsible for her suffering and Hannibal um, at least says that he feels the same way because they were both at the Hobbs house that day. Um, and eventually it gets to the point where he and Will are both covering up a murder that Abigail committed. And it's sort of in that way that Hannibal has Will like on his side and like can blackmail him if needed. So as Will gets deeper and deeper into his serial killer empathizing, he starts to kind of go insane. Not helped by ha the fact that Hannibal is kind of playing with his psyche in order to just because he was curious what would happen. So Will starts to lose time. He experiences chunks of time where he just doesn't remember what happens and he'll suddenly wake up in another place and not know how long it's been or where he is. He s loses spatial awareness resulting in the infamous poorly drawn clock page and he develops autoimmune encephalitis which Hannibal knows about but doesn't tell anyone because he wants to see what will happen. Throughout the end of the season, Will gets closer and closer, despite his declining mental health, to figuring out that the Chesapeake Ripper is Hannibal, and also that this killer called the Copycat Killer is also Hannibal. And so the Copycat Killer is sort of a season through line sort of thing, because when Hannibal killed Cassie Boyle in the first episode, he was sort of mimicking Garrett Jacob Hobbs, right? And Hannibal kind of does this a couple times. He kills Marissa Schur, which is Abigail's friend in a similar way, where he like displays her on a bunch of stag antlers. Um, and then he kills two other people, Dr. Sutcliffe, who knew about Will's encephalitis, and so he obviously had to go, and then um, Georgia Medchin, who saw Hannibal kill Dr. Sutcliffe, so she had to go. So these are all the, like, copycat killer, and in one of the ending episodes of the season, Will suddenly realizes that the copycat killer, all of these murders, are the same person. So beforehand, no one knew that, they just thought they were like distinct murders that happened to mimic the cases that Will was working on. So Will realizes this, and he immediately tells Hannibal about it. So Hannibal does what any self-respecting serial killer who knows that someone is close to catching him would do, and he initiates a plan that he's been working on throughout the whole season um, of framing Will for those murders, and he does it... <sighs> 
He does it beautifully. Oh my god. It's actually kind of insane. In one of the earlier episodes, Hannibal goes into Will's house and feeds his dogs while Will is away. But at the same time, he kind of messes with one of Will's fly fisherman things. And we learn later that this is because he put the DNA and like biological evidence of each of the copycat murders in some of Will's fly bait stuff. Um, hooks, that's the word. So Hannibal has been setting this up forever. It's an airtight case. And as soon as Will realizes that the copycat killer might all be the same person and he starts getting closer to the Chesapeake Ripper, Hannibal starts building suspicion about Will. And Jack is the first person to get suspicious because we love Jack. He's just kind of slow. Um, Jack believes Hannibal almost immediately, um, and Will's rapidly declining mental health does not help because he can't remember spaces of time. He doesn't really know like who he is all the time. So there becomes this issue where Hannibal builds this idea that when Will spaces out and sort of dissociates, he becomes Garrett Jacob Hobbs, according to Hannibal. So Will gets arrested and the end of the season is Will in the Baltimore State Hospital for the Criminally Insane, where we know eventually Hannibal will end up. So, today. Today, um, yes, that was all an intro, good lord. Um, that was fun though. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about the imagery of the stag throughout season one. So get ready, because I'm fucking giddy about this. I'm so excited. I've been working on this for a hot minute. clip is actually the first time that we see the stag in the whole series. It's in the first episode and it shows up immediately after the crime scene of Cassie Boyle. And it's a crow stag because Cassie Boyle was displayed on a stag head and when Will approached her body she was being pecked at by crows. So as Brian Fuller explains it, he kind of melded the two in his head and it formed this symbol of the stag with the crow feathers. And the fact that we see it right after Cassie Boyle's death draws the connection between the stag and Cassie Boyle's murder and what will become the series of murders called the copycat murders. My Siri thought that I was talking to her. I said the series of murders that would become the copycat murders. So from this point forward, the stag will represent a connection to the death of Cassie Boyle and as a result, a connection to Hannibal and his murders. The second time we see the stag is when Will is looking over Abigail in her hospital bed. She's still in a coma and um, Will is sort of keeping watch, making sure she's okay. And it's number one, showing that Will is concerned about her. He feels bad for what happened at her house um, and he wants to do something to help, but he doesn't know what. And while he's there, um, the stag, he sees the stag sort of walk by the door outside the room which is interesting because um, as opposed to a lot of the other scenes, the stag doesn't interact with him directly or look at him or anything. It just kind of walks past, which implies that it's kind of something on the edge of his mind that he can't exactly understand why. And it's this connection between the copycat killer or between Hannibal and Abigail, because Abigail was the one who picked up the phone at her father's house when Hannibal gave the courtesy call to Garrett Jacob Hobbs. So that's sort of, Will's beginning to draw a connection between Abigail and the copycat killer. This one's kind of interesting. Um, it's the most vividly we see the stag this season, and it's Will dreaming about killing Abigail. He um, dreams of himself as Hobbs because he was empathizing with Hobbs, so he sort of is both afraid of becoming like Hobbs and subconsciously sees himself in that way. 
So um, he sees himself killing Abigail, the, or attempting to kill Abigail the way Garrett Jacob Hobbs did, and the stag is watching. So we can kind of glean from this that the copycat killer is related to Garrett Jacob Hobbs and Abigail in that way, in the way that Hannibal gave the courtesy call and was kind of watching what would happen um, and curious about it. The stag is doing the same thing here. Well? Dad? Yes? There's someone else here. Well? Well? This is the most, like, direct comparison we have between Abigail and Will and the death of Cassie Boyle, because at this point, Will is dreaming. He's pretty far into his mental decline, um, and he is dreaming that he's talking to Abigail, and she calls him dad, which is kind of uncomfortable, but maybe that's just my issues. But she calls him dad, which shows that he has, like, this paternal feeling towards her and that he feels bad, and he wishes he could get to know her and sort of, like, help her improve. But between them is Cassie Boyle displayed on the stag head, and that sort of shows that the copycat killer and the stuff that happened at her house, at Abigail Hobbs's house, will always like be between them. And it's not an accident that the symbol of the copycat killer and then Abigail and then Will are interrupted in their conversation by Hannibal when Hannibal comes to Will's office and wakes him up. So the symbol of the copycat killer is blatant, it's in center screen, and then the actual copycat killer walks in and Abigail says, someone's here. And then, funnily enough, right after the stream, Will and Hannibal discuss the Chesapeake Ripper. So that's like a more subtle sort of connection between the copycat killer and, or at this point, because there are very few copycat killer deaths, the um, killer of Cassie Boyle and Marissa Shore and the Chesapeake Ripper, and then Hannibal, of course. One of the last and most powerful times that we see the stag as a connection to the copycat killer is immediately after Georgia Madsen's death. So she is burned alive in her sort of oxygen tube that they're keeping her in because they're treating her like a burn victim. And um, then after that happens, Will is suspicious of foul play. A lot of people think it was just an accident, like static electricity building up in the tube, but Will thinks that it was murder. And then he has this dream where he walks outside and he sees Georgia Madeshin and she gets impaled by the stag in his dream and then she burns. And that, more than anything, is a pretty damn direct reference between the killer of Georgia Madeshin and the killer of Cassie Boyle and the killer of Marissa Schur and the killer of Donald Zetcliffe. And sure enough, in the scene immediately following that, Will goes to the FBI investigation lab and makes the connection directly in front of Jack between the four murders and first calls it the copycat killer. Will. Oh, 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 wait, wait. Whoever killed Sutcliffe wanted to kill him. How Georgia Madsen killed her victim, but, but not exactly how, correct? Georgia Madsen carved up her victim's face 
Sutcliffe was uh, nearly decapitated at the jaw. I mean, so she went further the second time. Serial killers often do that. She was copied. Like, uh, whoever killed Marissa Shore and Cassie Boyle wanted to copy how Garrett Jacob Hobbs killed his victims. So that is actually the instigation of that realization. And then, of course, he immediately tells Hannibal, and Hannibal is like, well, fuck, I have to deal with this now, and frames him for all of those murders. You were a fisherman or a hunter? Yeah, it taught me how to hunt. That's not what I'm asking. All those girls your dad killed. At this point, he is declining quickly. Jack is already suspicious of them. A lot of people think that he might be a murderer, and he takes Abigail to Minnesota to try and figure out what happened, to try and figure out how all of this came to be. This scene takes place in the Hobbs cabin, like, antler room, where there's, like, a bunch of antlers on the walls, and it is the third and final time that we see a reference to this room. The first time is when Marissa Schur is killed, and that's like the sort of ground laying one in the same way that Cassie Boyle's murder was the ground laying thing for the stag head. And then Marissa Schur was killed in the antler room. Um, and then Will hallucinates a thicket of antlers in another episode, but that's we're gonna talk about that later because it's related to the Chesapeake Ripper. And then the third time is when he realizes that Abigail has that connection to Garrett Jacob Hobbs and that Hannibal was keeping it from him. And he's in that room again. This scene right here is the last time that we see the stag in season one. So Will is chasing it. He's trying to hunt for it, which we can see, um, number one, hunting as a symbol is a reference to um, Garrett Jacob Hobbs because that was um, a big thing that he, he wanted to teach Abigail to hunt. And that was like the symbol for what they did with the girls and Will um, is hunting here and he so the dichotomy is sort of drawn between the two of them where Garrett Jacob Hobbs is a hunter but Will is a fisherman so the fact that Will isn't fishing here um, implies that he is feeling that connection to Hobbs more but he's chasing the stag which also implies that he doesn't exactly know what the stag means yet like he subconsciously knows all of this but he still thinks that the stag is something that he needs to like attack or defeat. He doesn't realize that it's been showing him the answers all of this time. So he's trying to chase the stag. He misses and he f follows after it. And it leads him to our first appearance of the Wendigo, which becomes the symbol of Hannibal as a murderer throughout the series from this point on. And that is when we have this realization on Will's part that there is this other person involved who he needs to look for that is framing him and is doing all of this. And the Wendigo is used as a symbol instead of the stag for the rest of this episode um, as everything culminates and Will then ends up in 
the Baltimore State Hospital for the Criminally Insane. So that is all of the connections that I found between the stag that Will sees and the copycat killer. So we can see here that there was like a decent amount of thought put into this, that the stag served as a connection between the death of Cassie Boyle and the death of Marissa Shore and Hannibal and the Chesapeake Ripper and Abigail and how all of that tied together and how Will subconsciously, because he dreamed about it a lot, on some level he knew that all of this was connected and it wasn't until the stag led him to the Wendigo or it killed Georgia Mention in his dream that he was finally able to make that connection like on his conch on a conscious level yeah not like subconscious conscious yeah on a conscious level he was able to make that connection because of the stag so I'm back a couple days later to record this segment of the video. Honestly, I'm really excited about this. The last scene that we're gonna talk about is especially exciting because it is so well executed and well put together. It's like, it's so perfectly executed. I could talk about it for hours, but this video is already long enough, so I will spare you for now. When Will first starts to investigate the Chesapeake Ripper murders, we start to see these connections between the stag and the stag imagery, and the Chesapeake Ripper begin to form. Because before, it had been a lot about the copycat killer with Cassie Boyle and Marissa Schur and then Donald Sutcliffe, but now we start to see those connections to the copycat killer and then eventually to Hannibal. So the first time that we see this is in Will's classroom. He hallucinates the stag approaching him through the entrance of his classroom in a very similar way that Hannibal did in the scene that we talked about earlier when he interrupted Will dreaming about being across from Abigail with Cassie Boyle between them. So number one, that's a callback to that scene. And number two, it is drawing a connection between the stag and the Chesapeake Ripper that will then be utilized more often throughout the season. The at large three in the murder of his wife and her family institutionalized at the Baltimore State Hospital for the criminally insane. Will is in a conference room being debriefed about the Chesapeake Ripper by Jack, and there's a bunch of other people in the room, and he starts to hallucinate this thicket of antlers around him, like in the room that Marissa Schur was killed in. So that's drawing a direct connection between the death of Marissa Schur and the copycat killer, because the presentation is about the copycat killer. So it's showing us that in Will's head, hearing about the copycat killer, he connects it to the death of Marissa Schur in the antler room. At the same time, Jack's words become kind of warbled and um, just form different sentences that sort of tell us what Will is afraid of. He's afraid of killing again, he's afraid of being institutionalized, and he's afraid of the urges within himself that he wants to kill. And that is a through line throughout the show, and I just think it's really interesting that they brought that in here when both of Hannibal's personas are being um, referenced very heavily. The context of this scene is that 
Abel Gideon escaped the Baltimore State Hospital for the Criminally Insane, and he at one point believed that he was the Chesapeake Ripper, but that was not the case, obviously, because we know it's Hannibal. And he's having this sort of identity crisis and trying to get the attention of the Ripper in order to figure out what the hell is going on. And one way that he's doing that is tracking down and killing all of his psychiatrists. And they believe, the FBI believes they had a lead, so they went to this observatory that Will is at, and Will is like feverish, he's sweating, he's not doing well, but he decides to go inside anyway. Except on his way inside, we see the stag. The stag shows up not in the observatory, but off in the woods. And Will is a hunter, he's a fisherman, he knows how to look for tracks. We see that in some of the other episodes when Will is, for instance, looking for some of a lost dog, or he invites Alana over because he heard some sounds and he wants her to help investigate. Like, we know that Will is capable of tracking down animals pretty well. So that is probably why his mind sort of projected the stag that way, even in his feverish state, he would have been able to notice that something was going on because Abel Gideon is not in the observatory. He ends up finding Gideon in exactly this way. He knows that Gideon's not in the observatory and he finds Gideon's car and gets in there and waits for him to show up. And when he does, he holds Gideon at gunpoint and tells him to drive. And Gideon obviously could overpower Will here. He is shaking, he's feverish, he's incredibly weak, he's hallucinating that Gideon is Garrett Jacob Hobbs. Will is completely out of it at this point, but Gideon plays along. And what ends up happening is exactly what Gideon wanted. Will brings Gideon directly to the Chesapeake Ripper because he saw the stag. And that, kids, that is some good fucking symbolism right there because the stag in this case is literally the tie that brings together the different iterations of Hannibal. And one of the last times that we see it in reference to the Chesapeake Ripper is when Will is led directly to Hannibal by the stag without knowing that Hannibal is the Ripper yet and has a seizure in his office. He's had a mild seizure. That doesn't seem to bother you. I said it was mild. And this scene and this event happening is one of the reasons that Will can later find out that Hannibal is the Ripper because he was there when Hannibal talked to Gideon even though he was out of commission because he was having a mild seizure or whatever. But yeah, so that is the ways that the stag connects to the Chesapeake Ripper. Basically, to summarize what we've gone over so far, getting my, my teacher sort of words in there, um, the stag serves to represent the connection between Will's subconscious and the different personas that Hannibal has, between Hannibal as a person and then the copycat killer and then the Chesapeake Ripper, and it's showing Will subconsciously finding the connections between the three of them and making those connections in his head. We see it with his realization that the copycat killer is one person with Georgia Medshin, and we see it with his realization that Hannibal is the copycat killer in season two, spoilers, because he can remember that time where he went with Gideon to Hannibal's house and the, the stag led him there. So it's a really cool symbol. I totally recommend going back and rewatching season one and looking for the places where the stag shows up because it's super interesting to think about like everything going on in the season when that happens. And I totally couldn't like contextualize everything. I don't have time for that, but if you go back and even just like watch like one episode that has the stag show up in it and look for the different clues for what it could mean and where Will is in his journey to finding out who Hannibal is, it's super interesting and I love it so much. It's so well done. All right, there we go. That's the end of the video. I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for watching. This actually took forever for me to put together. So if you made it to the end of the video, that really means so much to me. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you want to see more of my videos, um, I don't really make any of the same videos ever. It's kind of a problem, but I have a few others. You can check them out if you want. Um, yeah, I hope you liked it and have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much.